What a week. <laughs> what a week. The weather was amazing. The weather was amazing. It was ice cold outside. I'm originally from Florida, as many of you know. So for me, this weather was miserable. There's no such thing as miserable, although if the Rebozo likes the weather for us, it must be that there's a reason for it. But it was a very consequential and uh, momentous week. We had a lunar eclipse on Sunday night that coincided with Tu B'Shavat. Now, a lunar eclipse, the Gemara in Sukkot of Chavtes says about a lunar eclipse, it says that it's very ominous and it portends chas v'shalom, calamity and uh, retribution for the enemies of the Jewish people, which is, by the way, a euphemism for us ourselves, for Hashem's chosen nation. That uh, when there's a, uh, a lunar eclipse, which basically just means in simple layman's terms that the sun, the earth, and the moon are all perfectly aligned and the earth is now blocking the shadow. There was rather the earth is blocking the sunshine onto the moon, so the moon is no longer illuminating the radi- regular radiance that we see from the moon, the white shine, and instead, it's, it's red. Now, I saw it, it was amazing. I was actually on the phone with my brother who was 1,152 miles away, and we were looking at the same moon. Imagine that, the same moon. And this is not on a video, it's not on a recorder, it's not on a camera. I was standing in New York, he was standing 1,152 miles away, and it was a very, very beautiful bonding experience, a real experience of unity, where we were looking at the same exact object, even though we were divided by over a thousand miles. And I also realized that we were looking not only at the same object, we were looking at the same moon that Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov also had seen. The same intact moon, unaltered, unchanged, immutable almost, and perhaps even eternal-like moon. So I realized that we're gazing at the moon looking at that moon, waiting for the eclipse, we were looking at the same moon that all our ancestors also looked at. How beautiful. There was once a girl that told me that when she went to sleepaway camp, so uh, she was homesick. And she called her father, and her father said, don't be homesick. At night, go out and look at the moon and realize I'm looking at the same exact moon. And that bond and that shared experience was able to ameliorate her situation and mollify her and make her feel better. So why is the moon, the lunar eclipse, why is it such a spectacular experience? First of all, we have to deal with this Gemara. The Gemara says that it's very ominous and it portends calamity for the Jewish people. However, the Kabbalah bring down that when it coincides with Tu B'Shvat, that means that it's actually going to be good for us and our enemies will suffer destruction. And how fascinating is it that the Novi Yoel, in Perak Gimel, Pasuk Dal, if I'm not mistaken, it says there, that when there's a blood moon, and this is a, a perfect depiction of what happened this week, was a blood moon, turned red. So what will happen is, is that it's a harbinger from Mashiach. Can you imagine this? That the lunar eclipse is actually, a blood moon is a harbinger for Mashiach. It means that Mashiach is very, very imminent and very close. And then it says that if there's a sign below, meaning on earth, and there's a sign above, meaning in space, a more celestial a uh, type of sign, then certainly a, a sign of Mashiach, and there was a sign below, because that same day as the lunar eclipse, uh, there was a, an attack that Eretz Israel, that Israel waged against Iranian facilities in Syria. It was a very historical type of attack, because it was a fr- first broad daylight type of attack, where it was launched and waged in broad daylight to decimate the facilities of Iran. Iran was extremely infuriated. Syria was infuriated. Syria now threatened to Hasra Khalila to bomb Ben Gurion Airport. But you see that there was a, uh, a weakening of our enemies, just as it's predicted in the Mukubalam. And not only that, but also there was a sign above in space. Uh, this is reported by National Geographic. It's not me saying this, but just when totality was happening, totality means that just as when the lunar eclipse was actually happening in totality, a meteor came and struck the moon. I don't know if it was visible for us, but it was a seismic and uh, quite a drastic type of um, explosion, so to speak, in the moon. And you see we had a sign below and we had a sign above. So Bez Hashem, we should be zorcha, we should merit phenomenal things. However, a lot of you are listening to me now and you're saying, wow, it's astounding, and you may even feel a sense of elation, and you may sense this really great sense of uh, relief that Mashiach is actually coming very, very soon. But you could hear me, and the question is, 
You're listening to me, but are you really listening to me or is it going in through one ear and out through the other ear? Are you internalizing the message? Are you internalizing my message? Vayishma Yisro. This is Parsha. How fascinating that the confluence of events. You have the lunar eclipse. You have all the prophecies associated with it. You have destruction on Iranian facilities. You have the meteor striking the moon. And then you have Vayishma Yisro. Vayishma Yisro. Yisro heard and had consequences and had repercussions in his life where he was ready to change his life. So the Zohar actually asks, the Zohar Kadosh says that not only did Yisro hear, it wasn't his exclusive domain, rather, Shomu Amr Mir Gazan, all the nations, everybody heard, and Mir Gazan, and they became very frightened where they started quivering and trembling and shaking. They were having palpitations because they were awestruck. They were smitten. They were captivated. They were enraptured. What's going on? Kriya Shamsuk, the sea split. Utterly, utterly astonishing and amazing, unprecedented. So Shomo Amir Gaza wasn't just Yisro who heard, everybody heard. So why does the Torah make a point of specifically stressing Yisro? Vayishma Yisro, Yisro heard. And as the Kutzka Rebbe explains to Zohar, he says, because yes, they all heard, but Yisro was the only one, Vihifnim Esadvarim, that he actually internalized the message, that he took it to heart. And he said, you know, I heard a message here. I am actually going to allow it to change my life. And boy, did he change his life. So that's the question. The onus is on us. The responsibility is on us. We're living in phenomenal times. Times that our answers is only dreamt of, do not live to see. Little us, we are seeing things that no one that walked the face of the planet has seen or potentially perhaps will see. But are we gonna change? How are you gonna change? When, you know, the other night I was in the BGX Center and I saw, I think, 25 public high school students that never had a shaykhus, never had a connection from Brooklyn, local kids that live on our streets, in our neighborhoods. We pass them every single day. And they're the same B'nai Avram Yitzhak Yaakov, the same children of Avram Yitzhak Yaakov, but they were deprived of an education. Their parents were probably deprived of an education. It wasn't on their own free volition. It wasn't that they made a conscious decision not to, they just never, they didn't have the opportunity. And they're our relatives. And they're Hashem's children. They're Avram Yitzhak Yaakov's eight o'clock. They're their grandchildren. And when I saw them and they were, they were yearning. They loved learning Torah. And they're gonna make incremental, I'm not telling you they're gonna make huge changes and shifts in their life, but incremental, the fact, the mere fact that they're sitting there eating kosher food. And the fact they're sitting there learning Torah for the first time in their lives, perhaps. It's huge. That's a change by Yishma Yisrael. They're willing to listen. Are we willing to listen? So let me share with you what the Torah brings down to shame the rush. He says that Yisrael's name is a very interesting name. It's really a contraction of Yeser Vav. Because he had one name, but he had six extra names. So Yeser means extra Vav. He had six additional names that most people do not have. And that's why he was called Yisrael. Interesting. Then the rush says another reason. The Torah brings us down. He says that perhaps he's called Yisro because Yud stands for the Ten Commandments, the Aseris Adibros, Yud is ten. And Yisro was now Nichlal. He encompassed himself into the Ten Commandments that were given at Sinai. And then the other letters, the Tuf Reish Vav, is equal to 606 because prior to this, he was already obligating the seven laws in off, the Shev Mitzvah in and 606 plus 7 is 613. So now the Tuf Reish Vav is the 606 that he's now really uh, being included in. However, there's a fascinating Imri Emes. The Imri Emes says that there were four individuals, four personalities in the Torah that had an addition to their names, a one-letter addition to their names. Who were they? He says they were Avraham and Sarah. Avram became Avraham. Sarai became Sarah. Hosea became Yoshua. Yoshua was another one. And Yeser became Yisro. So Avram and Sarah got hay. Each of them got a hay added to their names. Hosea got a Yud becoming Yoshua. And Yeser got a Vav becoming Yisro. Why were these people so unique? Avram and Sarah, they were part of pagan families. That's how they were raised. They went ahead and they went on a real odyssey and a spiritual trip to understand what is Hashem? What is my role in this world? 
Why was I created? What was my purpose? What is my, what will be my purpose? And any human being who doesn't give this thought, I don't care if you're a Hindu living in India or if you're a Buddhist living in the Far East, it doesn't make a difference. Every single human being was given cognition, was given human capacity, was given a cerebrum, a cerebellum, a cerebral cortex. It is your job to start thinking about life, and especially if you're Jewish and living in New York State, or if you're Jewish living in Israel, wherever you're living, especially if you're Jewish. I'm accentuating the fact that if you're Jewish, you have an achrayas, you have a divine role. You have a responsibility to start thinking about life. Why am I here? Why was I put on this planet? Why was I born Jewish? What is my role? How can I contribute? L'sakin olam mamachos shakai. What am I doing to rectify and repair this world? What am I doing to rectify and repair myself? It starts at home. It starts with yourself. So each of these people, Avram and Sarah, they changed the world. They went out, reaching out to everybody, bringing people in, teaching people about God, teaching people about how to be humane, how to be kind, how to lift up the world. They got haze. Hoshea, Yoshua, was married to Rachav. Rachav had a very sordid and obscene almost past. But she went ahead, she metamorphosis. She transformed her entire life. And she put her life at risk before she transformed her life for the Kla Yisrael. And she became a Jew at 50 years old. The Gemara in Zvachim, Tav Kuf if I'm not mistaken, says that Rachav, the Zona, Rachav, who was a prostitute, became the greatest, one of the greatest Jewish heroines, one of the greatest Jewish women to ever live, married to Yoshua. So they obviously did a lot. Yoshua saved Kala Yisrael, the successor of Moshe Rabbeinu. Marries Rachav. He could have had his prime pick. And then, of course, Yisrael. Yisrael was a Kohen Midyar. He was like one of those guys that have the mega churches in Texas that are flying airplanes. You know, the, the pastors that get up there and they preach and preach. And basically, the underlying subtle message is maybe, give me your money. All right, the mega... They have these huge churches, they have devotees and disciples and followers, what we call Hasidim, Lahavdil. That was Yisrael. Yisrael had everything. Yisrael had wealth, probably had the most palatial and opulent home. He had servants. He had people that would, at his beck and call, do anything for him. If he scratched his nose, they would scratch their nose. That was Yisrael. And what did Yisrael do? He gave it all up. Laman Hashem, for the sake of Hashem. Unbelievable. So Yisra got a vav to his name, Avram and Sarah got Hayes, and Hoshea got the Yud. Says there, Maryam, that's Yud K vav K. Rabban Shalom said, if you're willing to go bat for me, if you're willing to exert, no matter how arduous, no matter how tedious, no matter how laborious it is, but you're willing not to succumb, and not to capitulate, and not to kowtow, but you're willing to be a Jew, you're willing to rise above. Are you willing to reach out to others, to bring others close? Change yourself, change the world, but I'm putting my name in you. That's a Yud K Vav K. And that's where Yisro got the Vav. The Yud, the K, the Vav, the K. Unbelievable, amazing. I want to share with you an idea that's more down Chidusha Rim in the Sif Sisadik, the Halakha Pilzer Rav. When Yisro came to Moshe Rabbeinu, Rashi says something very interesting. Rashi says that Yisro said he sent a messenger or he went at the periphery, at the border, and he said, Moshe, come, come, come get me. Say, come out. And Moshe Rabbeinu was the Melech. He was the king. He was the Mashiach. He was the Avbezd and the Posek. He had many, many roles. He was the majesty. And Yisro was begging him, come retrieve me. Come collect me. Come take me in. What's going on here? Why can't he just walk to Moshe Rabbeinu himself? Says the Chedusha Rim that Moshe Rabbeinu understood the message here. That Yisro felt dejected. He felt forlorn. He felt despondent. He felt distant. He looked himself in the mirror and he said, Me? How could I go into the Machani Ashkina? How could I go into the heavenly divine camp where the Jews are gathered and encamped? How could I face Moshe Rabbeinu, who is an Ishel Kim, who's a heavenly person, a godly person? Me? I'm a sinner. Look how I spent my life. I spent my life in the grime, in the refuse, the nadir, the lowest, contamination and pollution, decadence, 
doing the worst things. He probably did every upper in the book. Yisrael, I can't go. Moshe Rabbeinu, he was crying. Show me you believe in me. Is there someone that believes in you? Show me, Moshe, that you believe in me, said Yisrael. That there's hope for me. That I could turn the new leaf. That I am actually God's chosen also. And that I'm holy as well. Come get me. And says the Sipsi Sonic. That if you know someone. It may be a neighbor. It may be your colleague. It may be the little boy that you see in shul. Who looks like he needs some kind of help. Because he's just not there yet. Or it may be a student in yeshiva. You see somebody whose soul is crying for help, who's begging silently, help me, I am being swallowed and devoured and consumed by the hedonism, by the garbage. My eight Sahara is getting the best of me. I'm in the clutches of the evil. I can't control myself. I'm having a hard time. The yard should be yardim, he says. The lowest of the low is crying for your help. Go before he cries and help him out. Bring him in. That's what Yisra was asking for. Could you imagine? That's what Yisra wanted. How does Moshe Rabbeinu make him? I'll share with you an unbelievable Rabbeinu B'chaya. Rabbeinu B'chaya says by Yisapra Moshe that Moshe spoke to him. He related to him. He told him a story. It says Rabbeinu B'chaya that he has a whole phenomenal description of what il most illness, disease, and suffering is all about and predicated on. He says that most illnesses and most prognosis and most cures are false. What does he mean? This is Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar, it's not me. It's a hadama to Parshish Yisrael. You've got to look at it, it will change your life. He says that a cure is very often only temporary. And anybody who's healed they could rebound and regress, and they're in remission, and then chas shalom, they could get ill again. He says the only permanent cure is the cure of the soul. Marpe Loshon, from the Pesach of Mishli, the book of Proverbs, Shlomo Melech, King Solomon, Marpe Loshon Eitz Chaim. The softness, the healing tongue is the tree of life, is what sustains and gives life. It's not the medical cure. It's when a person is exposed to kindness and softness and happy positivity, not negativity and hostility, because Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says that negativity and hostility could actually impact our physiology and make us sick. Do you know that we have 50 trillion, at least 50 trillion cells in our bodies? And when we have positive energy, when we hear positive words, those 50 trillion cells, they can actually expand. But when we hear negativity, and when we hear pessimism and hostility, and when we're exposed to virulence, virulence as in something that's not peaceful, and that's not pleasing, then our cells contract. When you speak positively to somebody, and the only way you'll speak positively to somebody is if you really believe in God. Because if you believe in God, then you believe He runs the world, and He created us as God-like. What does it mean to be godlike? Godlike means Adam is Adame. It means I want to be. Adama means I am emulating and imitating God. And the same way God is kind and giving and benevolent and magnanimous, I am kind and giving, benevolent and magnanimous, and therefore I just want to give so that you should grow and be healthy and be well. Marpe Lashon. So when I give you kindness, when I speak positively, when I speak with faith, the mark of the healing tongue, I'm actually giving you oxytocin. I'm giving you serotonin. These are hormones, neurotransmitters, that actually make you happy and allow you to be healthy. Most chronic pain and most chronic illnesses, a lot of them are idiopathic, where nobody knows where they're from. You know why? Because it's rooted in negativity. I don't want to say use a pejorative and say it's in your head. Nobody likes hearing that there's illness in their head and psychosomatic. But it comes from negativity. It comes from resentment. It comes from passive aggressiveness. Marpe Lashon, the healing tongue, 
can actually heal you. Give somebody the oxytocin they need. Give somebody the serotonin they need. Because otherwise, when you're exposed to more stressful words, you know what happens? You get cortisol, and you get norepinephrine, and you get histamine, which constricts the cells. And all of our cells have caps on in the DNA called telomeres. And the telomeres shrink, it actually shrinks our lives. In science now, in genetic engineering, they're figuring out ways to expand the telomeres. We don't have to do that. It's all about Mark B. So it says Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar, and they look at Rebbe, that that's how Moshe Rabbeinu communicated to Yisra by Yisapar. He made him feel good. Positive words, that's what impacts a life. But more so, the Rabbeinu B'chai says that that's how Avram and Sarah changed the world. It was through Marpei Loshon, through kind actions and positivity. That's faith. Faith means that you understand that I am an emissary, I am a messenger, I am God's angel to make other people happy and to bring sweetness and positivity and kindness to the world. It's a fascinating Gemara in Baba Basra, Dr. Tezayin and Beis Gemara says that Avram Avinu had on his neck, he wore on his neck a margolius, a jewel. And with that jewel, people would look at that jewel and they would be instantaneously cured. Now, of course, the Rishonim do speak about the potency, the power of certain types of gems. There's, of course, the ruby and the onyx and many, many different gems that have curative powers. But we're not referring to this. There was some kind of jewel, it says, that Avram Avinu wore on his neck that people looked at and they were cured. Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar has a fascinating, a very, I think, radical interpretation because he says that it's not to be taken literally that it was a jewel, it was more allegorical. And what it refers to is the fact that he wore it on his neck. He says the neck is by the throat. And what Avram Avinu did was Avram Avinu was a personification, the epitome of goodness, Mr. Goodness, Mr. Kindness, Mr. Smiley. He brought light to the world. He shined, he radiated, he sparkled, he was effervescent, he scintillated. And that's what it means that he had a jewel. It was his voice. It was the kindness on his lips, it was Mark Belushin. That's what did it. And then the Gemara says that eventually when Avram Avinu passed away, Hashem hung it by the Chama, by the sun. What does that mean? Well, we know that Kabbalistically it's brought down when Mashiach comes, People that are infirmed, people that have disabilities or illnesses, they actually be cured. Hashem is going to unveil the husks from the sun and the different radiation are going to go, is going to go ahead and be able to be salubrious and curative to different types of ailments and illnesses and diseases. But that's not what it's referring to. I think that what it means is that when he hung it up on the sun, like Ben Bachai says, is it means that people understood that if we want to get cures, we have to be, have sunny dispositions. We have to start smiling and saying kind things and be happy. The Baal Shem Tov, I think, says, when God said, let there be light. It was the first commandment that God ever gave in the universe. And he was telling humanity, future humanity, your command is, let there be light. Lighten up the world. Stop being heavy. Stop being strict and serious. Be sweet. Be kind. Be happy. You know what? There was a kid that came to BGX. And it came like five weeks ago. He looked like a hipster. You know, you couldn't even tell he was Jewish. He's a kid that was from the inreach division, not the outreach. He was a kid that grew up going to the finest yeshivas, whatever the experience, he went off. He came here, and I'm thinking, how are we going to reach this kid? How are we going to impact him? He had no chayshik. He had no drive. He had no interest. He was burned. Well, I don't know what happened exactly. I do know. I can't tell you, obviously, but he was burned. Fast forward five weeks. You know, it's, it's, uh, unbelievable. You know where he is now? He's actually nervous as well. And he went on a birthright trip. It wasn't a religious trip. But somebody communicated with him while he's nervous as well. The person will remain nameless. And said, you know, you're there. It's a holy place, it's a spiritual place. Why don't you check out some place that is maybe a little holy and spiritual? And you know what he said? I was shocked. He said, if I could find a place that had the love of BGX, like I experienced at BGX, and the rabbi who loved me so much, who didn't judge me, and who gave me a hug, he said, I felt the love from that hug. 
I'm willing to check out a place. And he did. And he's in yeshiva. Mar pe la shon The softness, the healing tongues, the tree of life. That's what it's all about. Vayasapr. Sweet, kind love. That's how we make an impact. That's how we communicate. And that's how we develop a Yisro. Somebody who has Hashem's name, who has the vav of Hashem, willing to change his life because he experienced the love, because he experienced the sunshine. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I appreciate it. Good Shabbos.